Like, is this the part where I start singing right now? Or yep. Just... Yeah, yeah it is the part where you start singing. And I even, da, 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 I even da, 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 turn on my da, da. audio, so I got Oh, going. yeah. Oh, okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Murder Hobo Inc. Between the Rolls, where we're going to talk a little bit about this future shows, a lot about last week's shows, and then we're going to talk about something we all have experience in. But we'll get back to that. But you're not going to join for the chin stroke? Ah, there it is, there it is. That's a weak game, man. Weak game. (laughs) I'm facing the other direction. Sorry. (laughs) But before we get into that, let's go ahead and go through the spiel. You can follow us on Twitch, follow us on Twitter, take a look at our YouTube archives. If you want to hear our voices, not look at these goddamn handsome faces. I mean, what's wrong with you? We are Blue steel, baby. Yeah. Mm, mm. You can go ahead and click one of the link belows that will take you to the Murder Hobo Inc. podcast where you just get to listen and not follow any of our physical jokes or cues. And that's, <laughs> that's on you. Oh, uh, if you want to buy some cool and awesome merch, yeah! Yeah! You can get the new Crad shirts at our store. Uh, it's awesome to look at. I've got to talk about the other things, but I forgot what the other things were. And that is, if you want to talk about D&D, if you listen to what we have to say tonight or any of the previous Tuesdays, hello there, child. Hi. <laughs> so you can talk to us on Discord, right? Hi, Discord. Hi, Discord. <laughs> uh, or if you want to play in some games, hit us up at mhoboinc at gmail.com. We do have uh, a game this Thursday, normally it would be filled by a... No, 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 no. You can't join. You're not old enough because this is for mature audiences only. Look at my child as I cuss in front of him. I, I won't do that, unfortunately. Everyone else can. Everybody uh, knows you do, Kyle. <laughs> no. Only when the cameras are off and it's not being recorded. Oh. Here. You can take those, but you have to run away with them too, okay? Yes, by all means, give him something to put in his mouth and then run. Yeah. <laughs> DCS will be over shortly. <clears throat> Those D20s look like Jolly Ranchers. Ah! <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> Yep, you're still muted. <laughs> uh, I'll help you out. Uh, also, don't forget at Pirate Dog Dice for custom dice at Pirate Dog Dice on Twitter. Don't have any with me right now. Uh, and if your game stinks, unlike ours, ours smells like success. Go ahead and My check back. out. You're back. You're go back. ahead and okay. do the adventure sense. <clears throat> you just did the adventure sense. Do it. I did. Oddfishgames.com. <laughs> Go to oddfishgames.com. They also have their Gen Con coming up here and they need some help. Go hit up oddfishgames.com and see how you can help out either getting some of the smelliest merchandise you've ever picked up. Uh, That is not a bad thing. Uh, Some might say it's pungent, acrid, aromatic, aromatic, fetid, foul-smelling, fragrant, moldy, musty, notorious, odiferous, odor, odorless, it's not odorless. Let me not that. odorless. This it is, is not old, odorless. perfume, pungent, putrid, rancid, rank, reeking. It gets really bad now. Uh, odious. Scented, smells, spicy, steno, sweet, waft, or whiffed. Wow, waft. Get a well, waft. Welcome That's to good. Synonym Show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I just, uh, I have the sensory detail words list right there, and it's just like, yeah, you gotta have that. Uh, they also have the Shine Project. If you are writing up a story and you need some help kind of figuring out all that literature, humble bug, maybe you're not one of them educated folks like uh, that fella to the left of me or the right of me or the bottom of me. I don't know. I just have a college education and I'm just pretty to look at. And that's why they make me host on the show here. And finally, Pirate Dog Dice. Already oh, did no, that. you did Pirate yeah, Dog Dice. Already you did, did that. that. Uh, you know, I I just combine the Pirate Dog Dice for when you're rolling like shit. And you just go into, you know, Oddfish Game Sense, Venture Sense, and then it just works out so well like that. Uh, we do have a game this Thursday uh, that is open. If you hit us up at mhoboinc.com, 
you too can play on Murder Hobo Inc. Stealing the cred spot this week with an awesome Dragonlance campaign hosted, DM'd, GM'd by Bran, a.k.a. DJ. Or DJ, a.k.a. Bran. Or a.k.a. Dayton. Dayton. That's his real name. D- or DM DJ. Mm-hmm. There you go. Boy, that sounds like... You know, DJ. DJ. I don't know. Morning, morning talk show. But before we get any more further into the future with that, we got to go back into the past. We got to talk about last Thursday's game in And the person who will, of course, do the introduction to that is our wonderful player, the amazing, wonderful David. David. Reeling them in, folks. <laughs> incomparable and Introduce incontinent. You. <laughs> Not incontinent. <laughs> you can't see his bottom half, and you can't. No, no, no. Yeah, I got the don't think her on. That's right why now. he shifts over so much. Yeah, that's to make it. room for stuff. I'm trying to like adjust to the camera. There we go. Uh, anyway, hi, I'm David. Uh, you can usually find me here most Tuesdays on Between the Rolls, but other than that, I am also on Cacophony. Yes, our uh, Thursday campaign that kind of runs uh, opposite Thursdays of the Cred campaign. I am also Inve and in the Saturday Calamity campaign. So, we have an episode coming up this week, folks. Uh, also, uh, yeah, I play Ingbe in that and Crow on the B side, the boys from Toe Town. So there we go. And I roll like roll like crap and people die. So anyway, uh, A yes. Lot of people die. Well, I got I got lucky this week on Cacophony. So anyway, <laughs> Cacophony. Yes, we pick up we pick up where we left off. Uh, the previous episode, we arrived at the Grand Academy uh, in our search for Mortimer J. Sneed to deliver the nuclear football that we had uh, for Mortimer to help them figure it out, destroy it, or you know, entomb it in some kind of reliquary or something. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, as we arrive, uh, Mortimer makes his sudden entrance and happy to see us. Turns out he is critically injured and he didn't quite realize how bad. Eventually, we've got him to the Grand Academy's infirmary where they had to work on him frantically. Uh, so if uh, in D&D they have something like a person's going to code, well, yeah, that, that was going to happen with Mortimer. It was pretty dire. Zadar and Camille, of course, waited, and Zadar hung up by the infirmary trying to get some kind of update on, on Mortimer, uh, our Arakakra, uh clerics at the grand academy rushed us out because it was pretty dire sent another aracraca on a um on a mission uh to zadar's knowledge was not able to discern what that was uh and things were just looking dire uh three days uh had passed uh with zadar and camille waiting uh you know uh, just on bated breath to find out the fate of Mortimer J. Sneed and to offer support in any way that there, there can be. They find out from uh, the other professors uh, fr- and also from Zephyr and Frank, what was the other professor's name? The assistant professor of the young orc. You're muted. Garignon, sorry about that. Garignon, okay. Uh, with them uh, mentioned that uh, that the Mortimer is not the head of the Grand Academy, that there's actually somebody else. And again, God damn it, I forgot the name, Frank. What was it again? Go. Uh, soon, Semp is the, Semp. Head, is the head of the Grand Academy in your timeline. It's another S name, folks, that it comes up with. So, uh, yeah. Shit we tried and to syphilis were already taken. They were already taken, yeah. 
Uh, so <laughs> we try to gain word audience with her. Unfortunately, she is pretty standoffish. Uh, eventually we do, uh, we inform her, uh, who we are, where we come from, what do we have in our possession? And just at that moment, the Arakakra arrives with the package that the cleric needed. They tend to Mortimer and he starts to recover. So I don't think Mortimer will ever be the same after this, but, uh, it was pretty dire. So Mortimer recovers. We inform uh, Camille and Zadar, uh, inform him that uh, this is what we have with, you know, the situation in Telosia. This is the object that devastated uh, the continent. And um, yeah, uh, Mortimer decides he wants to investigate this thing. So they go down, he takes us down into this facility to study it, which is a bunker underground uh it's a research laboratory head head under uh by no other than point dexter yes folks dexter's laboratory the the gnome uh who presides over the science aspect over at the grand, grand academy mortimer rushes us out uh Tests are conducted. It sounds insane from where our, our standpoint is, was we're separated by this steel door. And um, Mortimer emerges and comes to the conclusion that this, along with something else that was brought to the Academy, needs to be destroyed. He puts them in a, 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 a package, uh, just some kind of sealed container and said, and came up with the suggestion that it be dumped into a live volcano. So unfortunately, our airship is MIA because we set them on. They had another mission to go on to. Fucking Gandalf. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so Mortimer secures passage, uh, passage for us on the Minotaur ship that, that brought us here, and uh, we make our way to the island uh it is a sheer cliff uh up to uh the top of the island where this volcano is and uh yeah we had to find a place where we could kind of take a long boat to to get to some semblance of a beach to uh make our way up to the top plateau area and then up on to trek onto the volcano well as we're there <laughs> We uh, encounter a strange individual. I uh, think uh, Tom Hanks and Castaway, who is in fact a castaway. And uh, yeah, I'm going on and on about this. <laughs> we meet this guy. Uh, yeah, there's a fight with an owlbear that was waiting in the in the high grasses. He was injured. We discover these berries with healing properties, and uh, yeah we end the episode right there it's a great episode it's very caring uh of course daphne is mia because she's enraptured with the tiefling that's on the ship so <laughs> there we go folks that is the episode for cacophony tune in the following thursday for the conclusion i think it will be our final episode am i right frank we don't know Let's see we oh don't know gosh so I'm yeah, going to say might... it's going to take two episodes. Coffins are measured, baby. <laughs> uh... <laughs> yeah, that's not good. <laughs> so, uh, so, sure tune, so tune in uh, the following week for Cacophony if you get a chance. Yeah. All right. And that leads us up to um... Saturday. Frank. Frank. That's his name. Yeah, Frank. Frank, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what that one shot you ran on Saturday looked like. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, back to you. Uh, okay, so the one shot on Saturday was called oh. The Hall of Shadows. It featured uh, our own Carol and Rob, as well as Kaylee getting her third game in, and a new David that will be replacing old David because he's old and worn out. Uh, yeah, yeah. These four were third-level adventurers trekking their way to Cathaway 
Arkpool, Metropolisville, whatever, during a torrential rainstorm. Uh, during their travels, the water actually washed away part of the hillside, exposing carved stones, a.k.a. a dungeon. Uh, they went in, well, they attempted to get in. Uh, one of the party was injured early. Uh, another party member was injured after they got in. And they hadn't even encountered any angry things. Uh, part of the charm of this dungeon was it was uh, some offshoot splinter cult of Orcus. Uh, and as such, there were traps, tricks, and problematic parchment. Uh, um, and uh, the party... Uh, let's say had their problems, uh, especially if you're being third level. Uh, it's a good thing they all had high hit points uh, because it yeah. was not... I, I thought they'd have an easier time. Uh, kitties don't use thunderclap underground or thunder wave underground. Uh, that's just problematic. Use fireball. Yeah, they uh, uh, and then they discovered uh, something I like to call the Orcus Moth Swarm uh, when they opened an urn. Uh, it's pretty much like locusts for people. Uh, and it was done right at the tail end, so Kyle's happy because we did run a little bit long. Uh, but the Orcus Moth Swarm, spoiler alert, took down two, almost got the other two. So uh, I, I think they ended up, the other two ended up escaping with 50 gold pieces worth of jewelry. <laughs> <laughs> 50 gold pieces? 50 wow. gold pieces. So they did not have a profitable venture. Uh, it, it's kind of cool. It was kind of written on the fly last week, uh, but uh, it'll be out for publication next year sometime. It's pretty fun. Go ahead and watch it. It's in the archive. It's still on Twitch, I believe. Yeah, it's probably still on Twitch, but it's I in know. the archive. Yeah. It's in the audio archive. Take a look at that. Uh, this Saturday, of course, will be Calamity A-Side. So, but like Kyle said, there's a one-shot on Thursday. Yeah. That was Saturday. What happened on Sunday? <laughs> Sunday was the Margu campaign uh, featuring the Franks, a.k.a. the Trigenerational Group. They are in the middle of Chasm Peaks, seeking out the elusive and probably non-existent Dragon Horde. Uh, a couple episodes previously, they were able to defeat a Red Dragon. Now they presume that the Horde is somewhere in Chasm Peaks. Uh, they have had their problems with a party of first-level halflings. They've had a problem with a fourth-level group of gnomes. They've had problems with ropers. Uh, this time it featured crystal spiders and a little tiny doll left by a drow little girl. Uh, <laughs> it, caused a, <laughs> it caused a fair bit of problems with them, uh, but they were able to go ahead and get a good lead on things. Um, but... They are on a definitive timeline. They are not mapping, and they have no desire to come back from whence they came. Uh, odds are these fuckers are lost in Chasm Peaks for quite a while, which I, I love that. I, I love yeah. that. That that brings romance to me. I, I don't know about anybody else, but just just kind of warms the heart. Warms you know? the warms the cockles of my heart. You know, it's a it's a real love for the game back to you Kyle that was Sunday <laughs> he doesn't know I what to feel me. like someone's trying to hint at something but uh, do, you, do you want me to keep going head. or do you want to go yeah go for it you keep going folks we're going to go ahead and talk about romance uh and who better? Oh, to... that's what you were trying. To... That's oh, it. yeah. Who better to talk about romance than three old bearded guys? Uh, yeah, if exactly. We can't... Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa! This is not a beard. This is mutton chops, baby. Shaking hands in the middle. Yeah, three. <laughs> the sausage fest is going to train you all on the art of seduction, seduction tonight. <laughs> uh, primarily, uh, as we always do. We're going to try and teach you a little bit of something to go ahead and, and, and stick in your milieu, your campaign, uh, your one shot. Uh, and one of the things uh, that is uh, quite common 
is romance. I mean, you've got things like uh, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, you've got Lady Bathory, although that wasn't really romance. That was more horror. Uh, but we've you've got uh... Secret Tunnel! <laughs> Secret Tunnel! <laughs> Uh, which is an avatar thing for those who know. <coughs> Big mountain in the middle, two lovers on either side, and they make a secret tunnel to meet in the middle. Aww. Uh, you guys were thinking something terrible and something else, I'm sure. I'm I've already started to draw it. So. I'm thinking of a really bad Bobby Darren song from the 50s. So, yeah. <laughs> That's right. I forgot to mention we're old guys, too. We're old guys. Uh, we're. David, what's your favorite romance trope? The spurned lover. That's my favorite trope. Nice. Oh. You don't so, want to elaborate on that? Oh, the <laughs> We're trying to fill time here, dude. <laughs> yeah, spurn, uh, spurned lover hires party to exact revenge on nice. uh, her Hey, that ex. sounds like it should have been written down. Her ex that is uh, about to be married. Go Wedding on. crashers. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I want to hear how you take wedding crashers and turn it into a D and D scenario. It can go. be done. <laughs> it can be done. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So so yeah, young maiden uh, who was uh, um, spurned by her first love, uh, only to be cast aside. Uh, because this person is an opportunist in a CAD and uh, actually found greener pastures, so he thought. So, so to exact revenge, he hires a bunch of uh, a couple of bards to infiltrate and cause chaos during the wedding ceremony. Oh, that would be great! I could see that. You make like a checklist of like, okay. If they destroy at least three of five things going out the wedding, the mm -hmm. wedding is ruined. The wedding is canceled. Charm person going off everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Bridesmaids are just, yeah, it's just, yeah. Okay. So, Pandemonium. How, so who hires the adventurers or are they just like uh, the spurned visitors, lover, right? The spurned lover oh, does okay. it. Yeah. She's trying to get back at her, her, uh, previous paramour that's marrying somebody else with a larger dowry so hmm. who's there to defeat the party kind of uh, a protagonist uh, woo love <laughs> uh the best man <laughs> oh ooh, that's a nice touch is he a paladin mm -hmm. Yeah, he can be. I mean, paladins can be a jerk. So yeah. <laughs> really, I, I let, let me try and wrap my thoughts around paladins being jerks. No. I'm gonna have to question that one. No, you're correct. <laughs> oh yeah. So so yeah yeah. The best man tries to take things well in hand, but of course the smarmy bards uh come out on top. <laughs> That's not a bad idea. Yeah, um, a lot of charisma saves <laughs> and checks all over the place. I want to so. say this so everybody can roll their eyes. Let's hear about Kyle's love tunnel scenario. <laughs> a love tunnel scenario? Yeah. Uh, uh, again, this is just an episode of Avatar. Uh, 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 but uh, they have this mountain. Uh, and it's a very much the Romeo-Juliet kind of deal. Uh, but uh, because both of the two kids are magical they manage to weave a pathway through a maze in a tunnel um and they manage to meet each other in the middle but whoever tries to follow them gets lost and probably dies in the tunnel from the minotaur I mean, is there a minotaur uh, there's got to be uh, a minotaur no no there's the the mole badgers yeah they're adorable Massive, mm -hmm. terrifying, but but yeah. adorable. Yeah, Spider Man there. No, no, no Spider Man. <laughs> okay, the Spider of Lang maybe. Nice. Uh, but the trick of the whole thing is that uh, <laughs> if you uh, enter the tunnels and you want to find a way through, you actually have to put out your light and uh, uh, stones that light up in the dark 
will lead you through one way of the tunnel to the other. Turn on your heart light. <laughs> wow. That's cool. Now, uh, true, uh, honest time here, folks. I was not slated to be on the show, so I have not given this much thought after I wrote it. Uh, I pretty Neither much write this crap and screw over everybody. So I'm going to look at my notations. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to go with number five. Uh, the problem is that the magical cursor spell has befallen a PC, uh, and that's how you bring romance into it. If you've seen Willow, uh, you know when Mad Mardigan gets hit in the face. Camille has lots of yes. Oh, she'll be mentioned mm -hmm. later. Our <laughs> producer is questioning the order. Uh, but Mad Mardigan gets hit by the brownie bag, and he falls in love with at that time, the uh, bad girl. Uh, oh, yeah. and, and if you haven't seen Willow, why are you even watching this show? Go find Willow. You need to watch it because You've never they're seen making it. A, they're oh. going to make it a series on Netflix, Kyle. So you got to watch it. That's so. true. It is older than Kyle. I think it's on it Tubi or uh, one of the free ones, Pluto or Tubi. You got to see it. Uh, and yeah, you can actually it watch out. it with Arlo because it's, it's clean. It's very family friendly and uh yeah. I, I gotta say val kilmer <laughs> oh it's val awesome mad martigan is mad martigan an is... awesome category is oh god yeah he, amazing character he is he knocks that one out of the park with his future wife um who is the bad lady uh, but yeah, so uh, i would say i really can't craft a campaign around it because it would become old and kind of feeble but i can see doing a one shot or maybe even a sub part of the campaign uh and, and victimize a pc with some kind of curse that maybe they love everybody you know they're a hippie uh and yeah, it's man. the meat shield so you got to cure this guy otherwise your adventuring party is foot done so i i, I think well I, let me uh, sidetrack you a little sure. bit. Uh, I've seen your plot options. How about uh, uh, as DMs um, talk about how romance, the different types of romance that we can have in games, or I mean, we're talking about one-shot plots and devices. Sure. Maybe let's move on to campaigns a little bit where we talk about uh, PC on PC romance, PC on NPC romance. And NPC on NPC. Sure. Is that, should I not have said on NPC? That sounds so Are PC. You, you, you already went down that trail, so you're yeah. kind of screwed. <laughs> when your player decides to get with that NPC and gets on top of you and it's just awkward. Wow. No, um, but uh, how do these um, interactions, how are they similar? How are they different? Uh, and then maybe how they move on to story or how they move the story forward. Um, I can start if you want. Yeah, Frank. Go uh, ahead. I, th I think the best example, and David would know this, is uh, Camille and her love of uh, Odic, uh, Oric the Stinky. Uh, mm -hmm. He made quite the favorable impression on Carrie's character. Uh, he was uh, smelled like lavender. Uh, so he doesn't smell like the Northlands. That's why they call him the Stinky. But he smells like lavender. Very charming. Brought her coffee. Uh, very personable. Uh, he, he was made that way for that reason. As it turns out, uh, they ended up having to go to Freckland. Uh, well, they landed Not on had Freckland. To. Yeah, they <laughs> accidentally landed on Freckland. So they decided to look him up. One of the items... Uh, knowing him not quite inside and out was uh was he married he's married to five uh and then <laughs> not only did that piss off the wife uh it made for an interesting story sidetrack so when they your were, wife or my wife his wife yes. no, no his, his the wife, wife in real life yeah. <laughs> C carrie was not thrilled that that piece of information had not come to light uh, I did point out that you never asked, so because <laughs> that always Sorry, makes the situation better. You okay. never ask. You've got to use your words when you play D and D. <laughs> uh, but uh, I thought that was an interesting uh, side issue, and I had known uh, since before they had landed on Freckland that <laughs> Odic was a Mormon. So <laughs> it was kind of fun to play that off because. 
uh, after rescuing them, they were in pretty bad shape. And he, you know, he, he brought his wives in to attend to them. And he saw absolutely no issue uh, with the dichotomy of a one-on-one -on -one relationship versus a potential six-on-one relationship. Uh, <laughs> but no you know, man ever does. Yeah. Be fair. But, but I'm when, imagining <laughs> Bill Paxton with uh, <laughs> good love. <laughs> But yeah, you know, when when you do that to players, uh, they can take it uh, personal, which, you know, it adds depth to the story. Uh, it, but as it shows up, uh, Camille, her character, doesn't want anything to do with him. So his storyline uh, finishes right there. Now, maybe if it's at the end of the campaign, maybe she decides to retire. Maybe she decides to become Odic Sixth. Uh, hard to say. But in like hell, she will as the response from the other room. Surprisingly <laughs> enough, that was loud enough we heard it. <laughs> so well, she'll get the reverb as she listens to it. So that, well, that, so that, that's, here's a question for sure. you, real quick, to interrupt you. Nope, I'm done uh, talking. Go ahead. Did you introduce him knowing uh, uh, that Carrie was going to be interested in the character, or did you just introduce him? He's going to be kind of nice. What? Uh, how did that go? He was one of. Actually, they had dealt with him in a single, right, David? Mm-hmm. Oh uh, uh, yeah. And then at the at the end of their tenure in Cacophony, uh, eight factions vied for their attention. Odic and his berserkers were one of them, uh, and he was near the top of her list. As it turns out, <clears throat> the group decided to go to Telosia, aka the American Indians. Uh, and help them first. Landing on Frecklin was merely an accident. Uh, I decided that Odic would have, or Oric would have uh, wives about the same time as the groups of eight came together. So, but again, no one asked the question, and I didn't feel like divulging that information freely. <laughs> uh, I mean, He's... as far as uh, Camille and Oric having a relationship. Did you bring Oric on with, you know what, we're going to kind of scooch him in this direction, and I know that Camille is probably going to hit off on this and be a little bit interested in the relationship and potentially pursuing that before she found out about the five other. Or I, she finds out he's a himbo. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that question might be better answered by David. I, I want to <laughs> say, from the DM standpoint in Cacophony, I, I tried to make a lot of the NPCs personable. There, there are a few <laughs> assholes, uh, including a pair of uh, detectives. Uh, mm -hmm. But as it turned out, those two detectives became kind of very friendly to them. So I oh, tried yeah. to keep cacophony light. Uh, clearly, you're never going to impress the witch, especially after they use Carol's face to smash the gargoyle. But uh, I, I think, and, and David, please correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think most of the NPCs in Cacophony turned out to be more favorable than problematic. But I could other, other than Pretty Boy Floyd, but yeah. <laughs> other than <laughs> the Syndicate. The, the Syndicate turned out to be a problem for Zadar. Yeah, pretty bad. <laughs> it was the boob, Zadar. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, no, no. All your characters were, you know, like I said, they come off uh, as pretty antagonistic, but they end up being pretty endearing by the end. So, Mortimer. You know. Mortimer. Mortimer yeah. was no, a giant Mortimer pain was in their never, ass. <laughs> it was a pain in the ass. He wasn't anta antagonistic. So, he was kind of like the nutty professor more than anything else. And now so. you guys feel bad for him. So, you know. Oh, well, he's, our, be he's about... our best friend now. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, let's uh, delve onto that a little bit more. Uh, Sneed and his relationships with about anything that moves in the past of Cacophony. Uh, and how does that shape campaigns? Uh, how does outside relationships shape campaigns? And how often do you guys think about these things? Outside being NPC with NPC. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. hmm. So, for example, in Cred recently, uh, uh, I've been revealing a budding romance that has kind of uh, gone between 
uh, Captain Kenza uh, and first mate Aiden Pasale, uh, who were the um, the officers of the ship that brought the PCs to uh, Farzine, much to everyone's detriment now yeah, he didn't screwed. have to knock to go in to to go through her door <laughs> so that's how you ended the episode remember yeah, yeah that is how i ended it and so how do you guys kind of do you include that in the campaigns uh uh like myself do you want to kind of bring those things to the forefront and being like yeah things are happening you know they're in uh uh feeling so down and low that they're now finding comfort in each other's arms uh, as a way of making the world feel a little bit livelier how do you bring NPC romance relationship to the PCs and how does it shape a campaign if it does do and we story? will start that's a hard one isn't it do you want to start David or do you want me to start yeah because all right all right, people who have watched the show know that I talk about my home campaign. And uh, yeah, the one, uh, my friend is uh, is the DM and she, I mean, purposely tries to punish me for creating an Asimar bard. And uh, yeah, this, this guy is irresistible wherever he goes. So we start the Barovia campaign, Curse of Strahd. All right, and then we end up in Valakai, and uh, there's the Wachter, Wachter family, and um, we have to engage with what goes on in Valakai. I'm not trying to spoil it. Uh, anyway, we get we get presented with this situation where one of the daughters of of the Vachter family needs to be rescued. Uh, she is under a particular type of uh, enchantment given by somebody that she was betrothed to, but had no feelings for. So anyway, so she was punished uh, with this enchantment. So anyway, our characters, our PCs remedy the situation. And as she comes out of this and she get and she sees us the first person that she is just intrigued with is the azimar because it's barovia they've never other than the the abbot they have never seen a celestial being before and she becomes enamored with him you know and you know my bard i mean they have failed on a really bad role or whatever and ends up hooking up with stellar stellar Vachter. and next thing you know it's just like stella is part of our campaign she's actually become a pc and our whole campaign is completely shaped around uh well it's just one of the aspects but around his relationship with her so how yes. was stella by starlight amazing <laughs> uh so anyway it was uh it, it it's just been the catalyst for our, our entire thing stella has become um one of uh, an assassin uh, out of old things she she becomes a rogue and yeah she's very possessive over my character so yeah good things ensue with that so Will she especially take a bullet for you she actually took worse. So, but if you see someone else, you might take the bullet from her. No, she's made it perfectly clear if I look in somebody else's direction. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, in our campaign, she got killed. So by one of the aunt. Um, Ambervilles or whatever from the Amber uh castle amber camping okay and uh alistair uh, that's my character actually had the ring of wishes from curse of stride have one wish left that he diet had coke. been holding for. for a diet coke yeah. 
Like so, a fish sandwich, please. And, and he brought her back, you know. Dumbass. So. <laughs> and, and get this, when she comes back, it's through reincarnation. Guess what she gets reincarnated at? And this was a random roll on the table, too. She comes back as an Asimar. So we got this oh. dynamic Asimar couple. So it's just Was it's Fred wild. Gwynn there? I, I feel like that would have made it better if it would have we, been we, we've had we've had it we we've had we've had Fred Gwynn like characters still. <laughs> and, and you know what I boom just like that there's a one shot in my head right now oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> which is the only reason Frank still watches these shows right. well we that bought shows it up. Stella and Alistair bought a bought an estate, and there was like the type of estate and what was in it. There's also, you know, it 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 needed to be, yeah. As we purchased it, it it fell into uh, blight and stuff like that. Come to find out, there's a lich in the house that we just purchased. So we're going to investigate. So we decide to leave our horses with the kind gentleman up there. And it's just like, yeah, it's just like, you know, sometimes dead is better. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> it was, nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So there was a Fred Wing type character. But yeah, but like I said, that, that romance has fueled and uh, shaped our, our campaign. So that's one one case uh, of and I'm sure this happens with with you know almost any campaign that relationships between PCs and NPCs you know become catalysts for other stories for the game. So, sure. and I mean, a great example: you guys buying a house together, only to find out that there's a lich that's more or less caused blight and curses upon the house. Mm -hmm. Gotta take care of that. You know what? Everything just causes another problem. Indeed. That was the selling point of the house. It's Stella Bachter. Come on, from Barovia. She found out there was a lich. She's like, oh, we got to have this house. <laughs> wow. Hey, oh, I, here's man. one for you. How about love not associated with a PC or an NPC? Uh, and the example I'll use to pick your brains is... Felix on our Sunday show would go ape shit if his prized zonky buttercup was injured. He's got an unnatural relationship with buttercup. <laughs> so I'm sure Carrie's chiming in on that. She's saying uh -huh. courtly love is what you would call that. So let, let's yeah. say it's not, uh, you want to use something as a plot device. Maybe it's a house, maybe it's a pet. Uh, maybe it's a magic sword. Uh, mm -hmm. How are you going to throw that into the campaign? And let's have Kyle try that one. I'm sorry you uh, um, you asked the question, and my mind went went somewhere else. Uh, uh, um, we saw uh, that. Yeah. How, how, yeah, no. how, how would you Gosh. use something other than another person? or character or NPC as a romance or a bro Ooh, of romance. We should have gone with that one. Uh, but yeah. let, let's say the love of an item or the lust of an item uh, causes uh, anything. Uh, Blake in the first Sedellus campaign absolutely positively had to have a bag of holding. And when I gave it to you, <laughs> he was pissed until he got his. Uh, but he, his desire was so focused on that. So what would you do about that? Can you pull a campaign out of that? Or would you just use it as a reoccurring uh, antagonistic situation? You, who? Yeah, you could not the pull easy a campaign man. out of it. I, well, for example... Um, uh, in my personal thing, I don't <clears throat> know we have, haven't we? Okay, I was gonna say I don't ever recall actually fighting a dragon in playing Dungeons and Dragons. And now that I think about it, no, I have. Uh, uh, the DM just made it completely underwhelming. Rest in peace, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, no, 
so you could ha- take a player, not their character, a desire to slay a dragon, um, and the the PCs at my table, they did have that option of, well, you know what? I personally have never done a dragon hunt before. Let's make a campaign. You're going to go up to level 10, and essentially it's going to be centered around you are going to kill this dragon and we're going to make a deal out of it and that your last battle is going to be fighting this dragon but everything else has been what are you going to do at level one to kill a dragon research yeah research yeah you got to do something reasonable at level one through nine until you get to ten and can kill that dragon and that's what the campaign was going to be about um however that wasn't something they were uh, uh, as interested in as I was. That's one of my loves. I just set that campaign to the side. So I think that is uh, entirely possible to run a campaign on. Um, and it certainly uh, is a glorious thing as a DM to get your players to liven up by antagonizing them, by putting a bag of holding in front of them and then giving it to a different player and then just watching that player get so riled up over it. And it's like, (laughs) you know what? He's into the campaign if he's that mad about it. Mm -hmm. It's a little, you know, all right, he's he's paying attention. They're paying attention. They're interested. We got to keep going. I've got Um, one. Go for it. So, but oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. So go, go, continue. Oh, continue. oh no, I was gonna uh, continue on with my uh, earliest thought, which was a uh, 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 romance. Yeah, you know what? I suppose it could be a romance of a thing driving a campaign. Uh, and we were talking last Tuesday about villains. You can find that on the YouTube archive or uh, in the Twitch archive down below. I'm sure for at least one more or three more episodes uh, uh, and one of the things we were talking about was villain with pathos and so I've always had this campaign in mind where the villain this huge villain is nothing more than maybe a level two villager who just makes deals um, in order to uh, essentially be Hans Gruber sets off a Tarrasque in a kingdom so that he could break into the kingdom's vault to steal one item, which is a locket that he gave that has a picture of his love who killed herself after the king in the kingdom forced himself upon her in an act of a prima noctra. Is that correct? Yeah, prima noctra. Prima noctra, thank you. Uh, and so... Uh, I would absolutely love building a campaign around this idea of, yeah, this villain is just a simple person who has a well-thought-out plan and the drive to actually do it, and these PCs eventually learning about this um, uh, in the end, after they defeat the Tarras, it's like, oh, where'd the villain go? He's gone. He killed the king, took one piece of jewelry from this entire kingdom's hold and left and was never seen again. Uh, And uh, so when you first answered that question about setting a campaign around uh, 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 an NPC, uh, uh, an item or something like that, that's the first thing that popped to mind. And I wanted to explain that a little bit before, before I lost it. And I might have to write that down a little bit better, but um, David, you were going to answer. Uh, no, uh, for no, you weren't going to answer. Well, fine, Frank. Back no, again. no, that was like a <laughs> mnemonic device for me for, for a second. I'm trying to interject. Well, the thing that I had in mind was actually uh, a familiar falls in love with its with its master. So, yeah. So a Go lot on. can be be taken with that. A fate because. Uh, a familiar is essentially a face spirit, and and the familiar is actually a pixie. So, you know, you can build off of it from there. How so, about how about lady, lady, lady Hawk it? 
Mm-hmm. I can see That's Lady over Hawk. My head. La- Lady, La- Hawk Lady Hawk was, was Matthew Broderick. Yeah, that is an ama- that would make an amazing campaign. Wolf, he is a wolf by night. She is the falcon by day. Oh, a hawk by day. So, yeah. Yeah, Rutger Hauer's best performance, even better than Blade Runner. Blade Runner, yeah. Okay, what was it called again? Lady, Lady Hawk. Hawk. H-A-W-K-E. E. Yes. That, that it, one's tough it's to It's an amazing find. movie. Yeah, it's an amazing movie, though. And, and the Bishop was an awesome bad guy. Just yeah. completely awesome. But Matthew yeah. Broderick is street urchin or some bullshit like that. Or yeah, an acolyte. I, I can't. He's, an, he's an acolyte. He's yeah. uh, a cleric. He's a monk. But so, yeah. <laughs> a very bad one. <laughs> it, it, is, it is a very good movie, and I'm with David. I think you can make a good campaign off that one. Uh, mm-hmm. What was the other one? There was. Well, so, oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. go ahead. I, I'm trying to remember. Go ahead. Well, uh, uh, talking about, you know, uh, you're familiar, and a few times ago, we're going to talk about another previous Between the Rolls, uh, where I had interjected a story where the fine steed uh, was an NPC who wouldn't do anything except for jewelry, uh, and we're talking about adding so much character to the steed uh, and all the hassles that have to go through it, and yeah, doing that with your uh, steed's with your familiars um, and adding so much character that your player falls in love with this familiar and just driving that to make story. um, That's Mm -hmm. a great idea. And then just taking that one step further, you know, um, Harry Dresden and Queen Mab, although I'm not sure that was quite a romance. Mm Hmm. Uh, they did some sporting on the table. They did some the sporting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, a romance between a patron and mm-hmm. their warlock. and they, Yeah, I mean, Carol kind of mentioned stuff. that before. Oh, she yeah. has. Okay, good. Yeah. Not, m- not similarly, but I mean, yeah, similarly, but uh, I think you're you're in a different direction than what she was. So, so but yeah. Um, one of the things that inspired me about the familiar though was uh the movie legend with mm. tom cruise the the fairy also whatever she also was... one that he hasn't seen <laughs> yeah the the fairy was in love with jack and when jack goes to rescue uh you know the, the main character. Yeah. yeah yeah she flips out she flips the fuck out <laughs> just go to youtube and google 80s fantasy rpg movies they're, yeah, they're all they're, there they're, they're quite a quite a few and beast and master and you know, oh yeah, my those. god beast master yeah at least uh conan well, could even be seen as a romance yeah and, and of course uh yeah. the, one of the best movies is hawk the slayer but Mm-hmm. That's not a romance. That's just hardcore D and D right there. That, that's D and D. Yeah, that's uh, hardcore D and D. Yeah, one of the things, Kyle, you mentioned was the yeah. the love of the steed. Uh, I would even at tack on love of thyself. Uh, two characters in particular, uh, Jason, aka Copious Vol Bitters, just loves having the spotlight on his character, uh, and that is one of his flaws because he and I both know that if I throw any attention at him, his character has to eat it up. Uh, and that puts him <laughs> in a very vulnerable spot. And the other one, I think, is Scott's character in the Calamity campaign because he has shifted that he, you know, wants the recognition by his peers. And that is something I'm going to use the shit out of against him. I mean, you can say he was in love with Gizba, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, you know. The, uh, the FYI, there's going to be a problem with that one. Yeah, probably. <laughs> you guys just got to the gates. There's some issues you got to take care of. I'm sure. But yeah, I, I think the love of oneself would also be a pretty good one. And, uh, I'm trying to think. The pro- Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Yeah. <laughs> Whitney Houston, folks. You just can't do it in public. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> this is in public, right? I'm, I'm in my house when I do this, right? This is a wild, wild west. We've already yeah. told them. They had to click on uh, the notice that this is for mature audiences. Exactly. If you're still sticking <laughs> you around, man, you know what you're getting into. 
Yeah, Senator like, Tubin, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> this plays in the Minneapolis uh, International Airport. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the men's room. Constantly, this show. Uh, All right. Uh, talking about romantic movies, fantasy movies, uh, uh, Neil Gaiman, Stardust. Yes. Yeah. That is an amazing and book. one. And, mm -hmm. you know, the main character is completely infatuated with, mm. uh, I can't think of the character's name. Oh, well, I'll go and I'll fetch this star for you. I love you so much. Like, go for it. Do it. Yeah. Ends up setting uh, uh, a... Yeah, it's a beautiful story. And, oh, my God, you know who is the the paramour in it, the other suitor? It's Henry Cavill. Really? That's right. Yes. Yes. That's... He is Humphrey. Yes, mm, with his mustache and all that fun stuff. Nice. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I think there's a lot of options if you want to use romance in there. It's not always mm -hmm. just the body bard, uh, although I oh, am. Yeah. <laughs> there are some bards out there who don't even wear pants. I think Jesse. <laughs> uh, but uh, Jesse. Yes. But yes. yeah, but yeah I, I think uh, we've given you a lot of options for using romance. It's not a girly concept. It's a mm -hmm. viable RPG. Uh, ah, what's the word I'm looking for? Trope, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I think that we've given you several different options on how to use it. Uh, what do you guys think? Yeah, and you can use it effectively. I mean, you know, romance doesn't have to be boring, you know? I mean, it can be quite, you know, you can write a pretty intense campaign about it, you know? Intense. Intense. Uh, smoldering. Here comes the smoldering, smoldering. from Tangle. Not necessarily meant that, and meaning that, but like <laughs> tension-driven, you know? And I mean, if, if you do it right, by the time you get to a higher level there's a lot of investment there and you can really piss off your players. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, Oh yeah. David was thrilled to no end that it took his father 11 minutes to die. <laughs> I have shitty percentage though. <laughs> dice rolls. Well, any dice roll where I have, where life is in the order, I'm like I'm like the Sicilian from from the Princess Bride. Right. You know? Never bet against someone. And, and there's another good life. romance movie right there. And that's uh, that's Princess Bride. Yeah, that's we Winnie made reference love. to it earlier. Yeah, mm -hmm. but. Uh, Oh, uh, you want to wrap it up, Kyle? You want me to? You want David to? I don't care. Oh, let's have David do it. No, because David I it screw is. it David, up. David, go ahead and finish it off. This is not a percentage roll. You should do fine. Oh, uh, no, I'm going to finish off it. this romance. <laughs> That's it, folks. Uh, for Murder Hobo Inc., uh, this has been Between the Rolls. Uh, if you want to. Uh, I don't know. I'm screwing it up. Take your Kyle. Just follow go. us on Twitch. Follow us on Twitter. Take a look at our YouTube archives. You, you can do that. And if you want to hit us up on Discord, tell us about some interesting romances you've had in some of your campaigns or one shots. Hit us up also on Twitter. Uh, yeah. You can also hit us up at mhoboinc at gmail.com if you want to join in and create some sparks here. Uh, that's pretty <laughs> much what we're all about, to be honest with you. Uh, and if you find that your love life just stinks, <laughs> adventures. Sense. Love stinks, folks. <laughs> love stinks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have to end that there, otherwise we get charged. Yeah. <laughs> get up, adventure sense over at Oddfish Games. Uh, if you're writing the perfect love story, The Shine Project, it'll help you out with that stuff. And guys, there's nothing like rolling twos on dice. And with pirate dog dice, they at least have a two on every single dice. And two is uh, certainly not the loneliest number. Uh, yeah, finally, another D twelve. Uh, you could always. It's not a one. six, <laughs> but it smells just as sweet. Yeah. <laughs> right now, his wife is giving him a dirty look about boring. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, uh, we will see you on Thursday night at 8 o'clock to do that. If you want to listen to the audio podcast, you can do that. Buy the cool cred swag. It's awesome. 
Also, the other murder hobo stuff is pretty good too. Yeah, um, you can't see it, but yeah, but it's it, there. It's good. It's good. Yeah, yeah. Guys, <clears throat> we will uh, see you later. And this is between the roles signing off. Bye. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Transitioned, muted. Yep, you guys are off the air. Yeah. Uh...